record. By the way, this uh, session is being recorded. It will be posted on YouTube as usual. I put my videos online so that anybody can look at it, review it, uh, critique it, criticize it, whatever they feel like um, online. So after this is over, um, I'm passing out a uh, sign-up sheet here. And what this does is if you give me your email address, and uh, I'll email you the links and also uh, a lot of the resources and information I'll be covering today. Don't worry, this is not a solicitation. You'll just get a thank you email from me saying thanks for coming. I hope you have a great time and I hope you learned something. So I'm going to start with this over here. And, and then uh, we'll do a sign-up sheet and I'll go around. So, free lunch crowd. Who here is hungry? Okay, everyone's fine. Great breakfast then. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we're going to be talking about some really great things today about flipping classrooms. So who here uh, has not heard of that concept prior to this session? Okay, so, okay, thanks for raising your hand. Well, anyway, so everyone else has heard of it. You're uh, semi-familiar with it. So please, anybody, what is your definition of flipping your cl flipping class? Anybody raise your hand. Good. Making the kids responsible for their own learning. That's a great definition. Making the kids responsible for their own learning. And I'm going to be honing in on that quite a bit on this session here. Absolutely. You know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get them to engage in learning and uh, in such a way that you know, it puts that personal responsibility. It puts, that, puts the, uh, the, their, the, their learning destinies in their own hands. Anybody else? Nobody? Okay, good. Um, the way I've heard of it is when the kids watch the lesson before class outside of the classroom and then inside the classroom it's more um, activities and the teacher interacting, answering questions. I don't know if that's accurate or not. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Right. That is one of the key principal components of flipping class is to create enriching engagement. So you're not there dispensing the information anymore. You're there to hone in on, the, you're, you're there to like craft them to discussions and activities and labs and whatever. You're spending the time more valuable rather than dispensing information. That's what technology is there for. It's, the technology is there to dispense the information. You're there to uh, make it better. So, what the heck is that sound? <laughs> All right. So, those are two really great definitions of that. So, one of the things that we're going to be talking about in this next hour is we're going to talk about, you know, the why. A lot of this, uh, a lot of this uh, flood classroom concept, like you're trying to go, okay, well, I've got this concept, but wh why do I do it? Why, why do I want to engage my students that way? Why do I want to put the extra effort to uh, create that environment? And we're going to talk about the what, the what tools, and then the how. Um, so, um, who, who made, anybody can answer this question, who made the flipping the class uh, concept popular? Khan, yes, Khan Academy. So we're going to uh, mentioning him later to, uh, as well. So, back to the age question, why do we flip? You know, you guys gave me some great answers, and those are just a few of the many, many reasons why we flip our class today. So I'm glad two of you interacted. I actually had more engagement at my 815 session this morning, so I think everyone uh, was more awake. Yes? Well, I, I will confess I'm an adjunct faculty, retired software exec adjunct faculty at our local university. And I flipped the classroom this last spring because the curriculum, the lean tech startup stuff I teach, is available all online mm -hmm. oh, by yeah. the father of lean, Steve Blank. He puts it available to everybody. So it made total sense to me to have the students actually watch his videos and go get out of the classroom so that in the classroom we could do, we could give them feedback, we could talk about their learnings, we could mm -hmm. talk about you know, what they discovered. Absolutely, and that's, that's one of the beauties of, of the web, is the, the wealth of information and the sharing of the information. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to transition away from this. The textbooks of yesterday don't fit the students of tomorrow. So we're in a system where we're, we're constantly being bombarded by, we have to buy these bound volumes of knowledge. But that's archaic. Now the knowledge is everywhere. The information is everywhere. But what we're, we're just trying to do as educators is to curate that content and be able to vet the content so that the students are learning the proper information, the right information. So like, like uh, what this uh, lady said there, the information is out there and, and they're good. It's good information. YouTube is a wealth of great content. OER content, uh, open educational resources. There's so much stuff out there that's bleeding edge. That's like, that by the time this book gets published, you're already uh, two, three, four years out of date by the time 
that's happened. And not to mention the cost and the trees and everything like that. But, uh, but we're trying to do it so that we're engaging the students, not in this volume methodology, but utilizing digital resources. Because by golly, when you put a kid in front of a book, what happens? The eyes glaze over, their mind shuts down, right? But then you put them in front of a, uh, it, uh, hello, it's in there. Then you put them in front of a, it's kind of cutting it out, um, uh, uh, digital content, which is roughly the same as the, the stuff in the book. All of a sudden, they're like, oh, wait, I can read that. Oh, I can do that. Actually, I'm the same way. Put me in front of the book, boom. I'm like, I'm like, all of a sudden, my mind shuts down for some reason. But put me in front of an iPad or a digital resource, I can read it. It doesn't make sense, but that, it's one of those things that like uh, really engages the kids. So. First thing I want to talk to you about is a little bit about myself. So you can kind of have a little bit of a background as to why I'm so passionate on the subject. You're probably sitting there going, okay, I read the description, I'm going to talk about Khan Academy, who the heck is this Knight character, uh, and oh my gosh, he's just a kid. So why is this kid up here telling me, a seasoned educator, about this concept, right? Well, there's a very good reason why, and of course the slide's going to show you here. Yeah. Very first thing I want to reveal is that I was made in Taiwan. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and uh, I was exported here. Huh? Wei Ni Hao. Oh, Wei Ni Hao. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I was exported here at, when I finally arrived at a tender age of two, because that's when they do their exports. And, <laughs> and then I was brought over here to the United States. You know, so because uh, my, my dad had a dream, you know, he wanted to live the American dream. So what did all natural Chinese people do when they, when they come over and, um, uh, and, and uh, immigrate overseas? They opened up a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> so I grew up in a Chinese restaurant, so uh, I understood the school of hard knocks and, and uh, how to uh, basically, you know, work hard and, and, and also, but the thing is, oh, thank you very much, I appreciate that. But also, well, on top of that, you know, it wasn't the, uh, the sprawling opportunity uh, that my parents uh, dreamed of. I mean, it was hard work. We, uh, we were impoverished and everything like that. Uh, so we didn't have all the, all the benefits uh, that a lot of people and opportunities had. So because of that, one of my big problems is that um, I'm also English as a second language. If you can't tell, I have a very thick Chinese accent. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, I had spent two years of uh, uh, in speech classes, and I think they did a pretty, pretty damn good job, right? <laughs> so, but the problem is that as ESL, I developed reading problems. I couldn't read a book, I couldn't read a novel and digest that information as effectively as my peers. So because of that, I, I became a more hands-on type of learner, because I couldn't just sit in front of a book and just read, read, read. I'd have to read it like four, five, six times for it to be able to stick. And even at that, it's not sticking all the time. Another problem. I was ADHD. I was hyper. I couldn't hold my attention. Nothing could hold my attention. But fortunately, my parents, having a Chinese restaurant, were so impoverished and so poor that they couldn't take me to a psychiatrist to get that problem fixed. <laughs> so, what happens as I try to work deal with this through my uh, childhood and adult life is that I turn this problem into my greatest asset. I'm able to absorb information at a far more rapid rate than any of my peers because I had the ability to not focus my attention on one thing, but many things. So I honed that into a skill. Now the reason I bring that up is because every kid now has that problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it actually isn't a problem. We have to address them at their level. So I was a little ahead of the, the curve of that. So, you know, so here I am, you know, as an adult, and I'm trying to address these kids who had that problem just like me. So because of that, one thing that held my attention was video games. You know, video games gave me a chance to be able to focus my attention because a lot of things were going on and I was able to, uh, to uh, do that. Uh, I love video games, I played it all the time, almost obsessively. And you know, anybody know any kids who do that uh, nowadays? You know, playing uh, Black Ops for like 10, 20 hours or Civilizations or uh, my, my game was SimCity. Um, back then. No. So video games is a great way to, um, uh, for that outlet. So, um, so what that led to, like uh, computers, and then into programming, and then where I am today, which is uh, a specialist in digital learning. So I have to tell you, the reason I'm bringing all this up is because of one reason. 
I'm doing this because I'm selfish. I want to develop a, a system, I want to focus on a style of education that works for me. Because the education system failed me in such a way that I was disengaged, uh, I didn't do well in school. In fact, I even flunked a math class. Chinese kid flunked a math class. <laughs> How absurd is that? But that happened to me because I wasn't engaged. Fortunately for me, you know, I found, found other avenues to hold my attention and then to be able to create success. So this is all selfish. So what I'm trying to focus on is that the traditional classroom doesn't work. I hope that nobody's doing this anymore in practice. <coughs> the rows, the, the, uh, the teacher at the lecture board, you know, students raising their hands, well, hoping to answer. I never rose my hand because uh, I was kind of shy back then, you know, a little introverted. And uh, that doesn't work because the kids are expecting this. Information at your fingertips. Okay, we're going to stick this in here, and then I'm going to pour in the milk. <laughs> I hope this works because I didn't bring a change of pants. Look, I googled it. It's a fake pigeon. <laughs> Just kidding, boys and girls. Everyone gets cake. <laughs> All right. I mean, so uh, I love Big Bang Theory. Anybody here watch Big Bang Theory? All right. Great show. If you don't, you should because it's a bunch of nerds had to, had to be uh, doing their own daily life things. And, and I have to tell you, 90 percent, well, actually, almost 100 percent of it is true. <laughs> so. Kids, they're used to having information at their fingertips. If they need to know something, what do they go to? They go to their smart device, they go to their phones. No, gone are the days when we actually had to go somewhere, the library, to find information. Gone are the days where you had to look through the Dewey Decimal System to find that book. Gone are the days where you had to search for that stinking microfiche, that one article that you're trying to read, write a research paper about, and you spend two, three hours trying to get that information. You go, all right, I found this out. Oh, this is going to be the basis of my research. I'm not going to look any further. And then that's how you build uh, that knowledge base. You know, fortunately for us, you know, fighting for information is not the problem anymore. It's how we give the kids access to that information now. We're here to curate the content. We're here to guide them through the content. The content is there, but we're, we're here to be the mentors, be the people to help them out. So when it comes to technology, you know, we think of this, you know, we're loaded down, bureaucracy, paperwork, forms, files. We have so many things that, that we're being bogged down with. But one of the things I want to expound upon to you today is that the technology is becoming easier and easier where it's not a problem. Am I still cutting in and out back there? Is it bad? Okay. Actually, let me move this here. There we go. Maybe that'll be a better reception. Oh, wait. Ah, let's loop around too. There we go. Maybe that'll help. Okay, so, so we're not bogged down by anything, but technology is becoming easier. So I'm going to try to expand upon uh, tools and resources and things that, that aren't too difficult, but you do have to invest some time to be able to uh, do it. So I'm going to show you this video from Katie, who is a math teacher, uh, about why she flipped her class. This is probably one of the best representations of. Uh, this concept. Um, play this. I've been teaching math for the last five years, and this is why I flipped my classroom. This is what my classroom used to look like. I was teaching to the middle group of the class. The students, they could follow along with what we were doing, and we were going through the content. While I had a group of higher level students, oh, that, that not was a challenge, <laughs> bored with the information, ready to move forward. And I had a struggling group of students that were not receiving enough effective remediation. They didn't have the basic content they needed to be working on the content we were currently covering, or they needed more help in order to be successful. This led to a 90% use of class time being spent on delivery and review of content. 90% of the time I was at the front of the classroom lecturing to a group of students and I wasn't meeting all of their needs. 
10% of class time was actually spent on application, which led to depending on students to do the application needed to be successful. They had to go home or outside of class and work on applying the concepts that I was giving out in class. This constant battle of not reaching the needs of all students and feeling the need to differentiate for all my learners let the teacher, allows teachers to feel overwhelmed and ineffective because we see the need for differentiation, but there's just not enough time for effective differentiation. This called for a drastic change in how we teach. This is where flipping the classroom comes in. Now the students outside of class preload the content. They get the information they're going to need for class. They can pause, rewind, and rewatch the videos as many times as they need to. They can post questions online to their classmates or to the teacher. And it's a self-paced program where they can be remediated by going back and reviewing former topics, or they can work ahead when they've already mastered a concept and are ready to look forward. They get the content here before class so that when they come into class, my whole classroom has now shifted where I'm at the center of the class working between these differentiated groups focused on different pieces of application. I can now work between each of these groups that are moving at their own pace. This has created a 90% use of class time spent on application of the content and 10% of class time is spent on delivery of content when I can answer questions that have been posted or take any other questions that have come up from applying the content. <coughs> now in my classroom, all students are engaged and challenged. I have time to work with each group, give them individualized time and instruction as they need, and I can actually work between each of the groups to provide effective differentiation for all my very groups of learners, my struggling students, my middle group of learners, and I can now extend and expand on my higher level students' prior knowledge and challenge them in, in the classroom. Now what do you think about that description? Okay. Yep. It's all about this. A lot of people when they're thinking about technology or flipping the class are thinking, oh gosh, my job is online. I'm going to be replaced. But actually, what happens is the exact opposite. You're in the center. You become even more important ever than ever before. Because what you're doing is you're, you're working with students, and they're coming around you. And the ones that need the most help, you can help them. And the ones that, that can go off on their own, they don't need your help. They don't need your attention. They're already doing well. So let the people do what they need to do. So you can focus on the students and be the center of the classroom rather than being in the front. So thank Katie for that video. <laughs> so that's why you flip the class. But flipping class isn't for everybody. It's not a, a process that everyone can embrace. So the first thing you have to ask is this, what kind of instructor are you? Are you the type that is the Lord by the board? Anybody know somebody like that? <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, no one was very heavy. Yeah, we got lots of chuckles there. Yeah, I am the master of all information. Everything I say is the word of law. And no, you can't get it from anywhere else. There's people like that, because that's the way they were trained, that's the way they've been teaching for, for a long time, and it's not their fault. It's just, you know, what they're used to. But are you the one who is capable of becoming the guy by your side? You're there, you're helping the students through the information, you're crafting a great learning path for the student. Are you able to embrace differentiated learning, uh, differentiated instruction? Can you be able to handle multiple ways for the students to learn? which will help you get into multi-modalities of learning. The best thing about technology is that you're creating options for the students. Some students are great at sitting in front of a lecture. They sit, they're, they're attentive, they take notes, but then you put them in front of a book, they're like, I, I'm not gonna, I, I need the instruction. But then there's other students who are really great at books. Then there are others who only can watch videos of tasks 
And then there are others who like uh, are only hands-on. So what, what the problem is, you have one teacher, but you can only teach in one modality for the most part. So what technology does is it gives you the ability to create a buffet of choices for the students. So that when you're putting the information out there, they have a choice. They could pick what works best for them. And that's what the technology does best. So can you use technology as a tool? And that's one of the very most basic requirements. You know, if you're technophobic, uh, then you can't do anything about it. Uh, recently, I had a conversation with a, uh, a technical high school uh, director who basically went through a two-year initiative of converting everyone to a flipped classroom model or, or with online. But the thing is, they did it smart. They basically said, in two years, we're going to transition. We're going to have to make a hard decision. So either you're going to adapt or you're going to have to jump ship. So naturally, some people left because they couldn't handle that uh, change. But the beauty of it, and here's the story afterwards, after everyone changed, after all the resistance, and they did it so well because they had uh, technology counselors, they, everyone had like peer mentors, every, they, they did a really great job at implementing it. Everyone says afterwards, they're never going to go back to the way they teach because they made that transition. So you have to be able to be able to transition, but it's not for everybody. This graphic here, this demonstrates how people learn. So we're, we're basically contrasting entertainment with education. So as a kid, growing up, you identified with these iconic cartoon characters, right? You know, Smurfs, Mickey Mouse, uh, Felix the Cat. They're there to entertain you. They hold your attention. Sometimes you learn a moral story, other times it's just goofing off. But that's how you learn. Um, you sat in front of a boob tube, and then you were entertained. That's what I call passive entertainment. Fast forward 20, 30 years later, these things come out. You know, PlayStation, Xbox, video games. The biggest difference between the two worlds is that instead of being passively entertained, the kids are controlling and identifying with these iconic characters. Mario, Zelda, uh, Link from Zelda, Mel uh, Solid Snake from Metal Gear Solid, and uh, Sonic the Hedgehog. So instead of being passively entertained by the boob tube, now they're controlling the destinies of these avatars. So if I was playing Mario and I jump in a pit, what happens? I die. OK, I learned not to jump in the pit. And I, instead, I jump on a turtle, I grab a turtle, I run through the stage, and I throw it at the, uh, at the Bowser, and then I win the level. And then I go, oh, I want to do it again. Oh, I want to do it again. I want to do better. I want to perfect it. Because they're controlling the destinies of these characters. So when we contrast that with the education system, we're teaching in this modality. Sit in front of me, watch me, learn from me. Where instead, kids want this. They want to control. They want to be ma masters of their own educational des destiny. And we, don't, we aren't able to give them that option. And that's why flipping the class is the step that allows us to move into that direction. So does that all make sense? What do you think? Good? Yes, all right. We're still hungry, right? <laughs> Anyone need a Coke? <laughs> so what made popular? Khan Academy. I love Khan, uh, Salman Khan because he did a simple thing. He put math videos on YouTube. Then people started using it. Then a miraculous thing happened. The press glommed onto a positive story in education. Isn't that great? So they, 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 they started promoting it. And now we have like all these initiatives like, you know, that actually is spurring uh, tech ventures, entrepreneurs, to develop tools and, and resources because people are paying attention as opposed to all the negative press we've always had in education. So, I, I credit him with making flipping the class po uh, popular. But it's not a new concept. It's been around for over a decade, so, but he just made it popular. What I consider flipping the class is remember back in the day, let's just go back like 20, 30 years or something like that. He sent a kid home with a book and he said, read chapter 7. And we're going to discuss it tomorrow. So they bring the book home and they, most of them read it, some of them don't. But what, what do we call that? Homework. So, flipping the class is maybe, mostly, basically homework 2.0. We're getting the kids to engage, but not just in a book or static content. We're giving it to them 
in a medium that makes sense to them. We're giving it to them in a choice that makes sense to them. We're giving them the buffet, and you can pick what you like. If you like cheesecake, then eat all the cheesecake you want. If you like uh, uh, orange chicken, go for that too. <laughs> Cup of chicken, chicken fried rice. <laughs> so, let me talk about um, what do we need to do. Let me check on time here. Oh, we're doing really good. Excellent. All right, so, what do we need? Well, first thing is content. You know, um, if you, you can't flip the class without content, whether it be content that's uh, already produced, like you, know, you probably have a bunch of PowerPoints ready, uh, you probably have some documents, PDFs that you put, pull from various resources. A lot of uh, places where you can find good content is websites. You know, they have a lot of good information. You know, make sure to read it and embed it before you dispense out to the students. And like I mentioned earlier, OER content, Open Educational Resources, usually. Uh, founded by uh, a university, so and which is great because these are educational resources uh, that are free and that you can pull upon as well. Also, you know, content from YouTube. There's a lot of great videos, demonstrations, talks, and that that uh, medium just keeps getting more and more and more. So it's more than just watching cat videos. There's a lot of great content on YouTube, TeacherTube, and uh, various things. And then you know, if that, if that information is not available, you can always create your own content as well, which well, obviously will take time. But fortunately, with uh, technology like the smartphones that we have in our pocket nowadays, we can quickly record a video, post it, and then it'd be done. You don't have to make it into a Hollywood production. Just do it. And if you want to revisit it later and change it and, and make it better, do it again. That's, that's the entire beauty of this. It's like, just do it, get it out there, and, and then you can perfect on it later on. You don't have to make it perfect the first time. You know, it's not like you're, doing, you're spending hours doing video editing and whatnot. Unless if that's what you do. <laughs> So, you need content. Then, the next thing is devices. Obviously, in order for this to work, you have to have computers. You have to have mobile technology available for the students. If they don't have one uh, available, um, tablets are becoming very, very popular. I spoke on that topic yesterday. So, technology, obviously, is important because you can't flip without technology, unless if you're just sending them home with books. But that creates disengagement. So, but a lot of people say, well, um, my, my students, they don't have access to technology. They don't have uh, a, a smartphone. They don't have a tablet. We can't give them a, everyone a laptop for, in the class. Well, unfortunately, the, those uh, concerns are starting to narrow. I mean, they're still there. But they're becoming more and more narrow as the technology inequity diminishes. Because, heck, who used to go out there and spend 150 bucks on a uh, TI-85 graphing calculator? You're using it for one class. Now you go out there and you spend $100 to $200 on a tablet, and you can use it for almost everything. So think about that. It's not that expensive. And recent studies show that uh, from uh, tomorrow.org, they did a survey. Parents are willing to invest in tablet technology if it's actually being applied for something. They are, but they need to see application of that. So, but another big movement that's really, taking, that's really uh, becoming more and more accepted now is the BYOD. Not BYOB, BYOD. And uh, as people start to embrace that, the beauty of that is like, you know, kids, they all have these devices. They have a Kindle Fire. They're playing Angry Birds on it already. They have an iPod Touch. They have these devices that they're already familiar with. They know how to use really well, you know, so well that they can actually text blind in most cases. But, and, and people are embracing the BYOB move. Bring your own device. So, Anybody here uh, in a system where you've actually embraced that uh, concept? Oh, a few of you. Actually, I had more this morning. <laughs> um, so it's, it, it, there's actually really great articles uh, about this. The school systems that have embraced this, everyone's like, oh, oh no, we can't have that. They're going to like, use it and abuse it and, and do all these problems. They actually show that there's less frequency of infractions or of breaking the rules by having the devices out. And I had a lady this morning say that, like, you know, when they, when they went to that mo mode, they had virtually no, uh, there's still a few, but virtually no infractions, because everyone doesn't want their device taken away. It's their, it's their baby, so they're going to protect it. They're going to do their own thing. So anyway, want to say something about uh, what they've done and, and uh, if it uh, worked well or not? Anybody? Anybody? Are we awake? Are we asleep? <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> yes, thank you. It's typically more of a uh, culture change for the teachers mm -hmm. than, than the students. 
Absolutely. It, it is a very big culture change because we're, 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 we want classroom management. We want to control the classroom. So and a lot of those things you know, can, and our biggest fear, open up a Pandora's box. So I want to tell you this little story. Uh, a year ago, I went to the Model Schools Conference with, uh, the, you know, by Bill Daggett, and he told us a uh, story about pencils. Now, this is a wonderful story, and, and I love how it, it illustrates uh, what we're talking about today. Back in the Great Depression, not the current one, <laughs> but the one, you know, decades ago, the education system was facing a financial crisis. Before that, every single student at their desk had their own pencils. The school provided their pencils, and when they went into class, they pulled it out, they used it, and they put it back in the desk. Everyone had a pencil. But then they were facing a budget crisis. So somebody came up with a brilliant idea, hey, kids have pencils at home. Why don't we allow them to bring their own? <laughs> Education community went to a lot of uproar. They're like, no, we can't do that. We can't. Some kids don't have pencils, but other ones, but they might use it for other purposes. They might use it to write on walls. <laughs> How horrible is that? They're going to deface our property and cause damage. They might use it to, oh, God forbid, pass notes between class. We don't want them to do that at all. And worst of all, they might poke each other in the eye because they're not being supervised. And worse, they could cause distractions. Now, it's just a very funny story. But it kind of like relates uh, back to now, where we're trying to see, okay, what are we going to do with these like you know phones? Like they could become disruptive. They could be. They, you can't write them on walls, but they could, you can write on a baseball wall. <laughs> but they embraced it. They realized it wasn't that big a deal, and then change happened. We all hate change, right? It's hard. But we're living in a, in a day and age where change has to happen. Otherwise, we lose the kids. And worst of all, you lose me. Remember, I'm doing this for myself. So, we talk about access. They need internet. You know. Internet inequity is becoming a thing of the past. Oh no, I don't have internet at home. Oh, you got one in your pocket? Oh no, I don't have internet at home. You got Starbucks or a McDonald's next door, right? You got uh, um, Wendy's. All these places have internet availability now. It's not as uncommon as you think. So there's ways to do it. You know, whether you, you provide it at school, they're at home. Kids will be able to get on the internet. They know how to get on the internet. They might even be able to hack the internet. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> and that, uh, last of all, we need online tools. And a lot of them are free. And I'm going to show you a really awesome one here. Uh, but first, another side note with uh, the Big Bang Theory. Anyone ever been on the receiving end of this call? Ma, Ma, calm down. Listen to me. I know it says click with the mouse, but on a laptop, the trackpad is the mouse. <laughs> now, put your finger on it. It doesn't matter which finger. <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> now, move it down to your email icon. The, the, the little envelope. What do you mean, what does it look like? It looks like an envelope. <laughs> Fine, but don't look at the computer. Don't use it. Sure, we can exchange it for a salad spare. Goodbye. <laughs> uh, anybody have been on the receiving end of that call? But remember, the beauty of technology is that it's becoming uh, easier. So, let's talk about how do we do it. Well, you need, there's uh, four categories of tools that are out there. And you need, uh, you don't have to add every single component, but they're, they're, they're very necessary. First, uh, I'm going to talk about the. I'm going to show you a project management tool that's really awesome. That's free. Then we're going to, we're going to talk about actually a, a little bit about learning management systems and see who's using what. Uh, content management systems are actually very important because I, one of the worst things I've seen with uh, with flipping classes is what, what I call that uh, uh, information spew. That means that I'm going to put all this, these links and everything in one spot, and then you know, a kid, you go there and click on the link, and and those are assignments and. and I mean, it's not, it needs to be better crafted. And then uh, content creation tools, in case you can't find it, you can't uh, get to it, uh, you need the ability to be able to do that. Um, and content creation tools, there's a lot out there, which is basically as simple as you recording something on your cell phone to iPad apps that record uh, Khan Academy style videos, uh, like a really good one called Edu Creations. 
um, which allows you to do that, to like you know, uh, like uh, Camtasia, which allows you to screen capture and things like that. So um, I actually will spend a little time on this. I'll just, I'll just email you resources and links on that. I'll talk about the top two, three. Okay, so this first one is a content management tool. I mean, a project management tool called Trello. It's absolutely free, which is the beauty of it. And here, take a look and see how amazing it is. If you've ever had to coordinate a team of people working on multiple projects, you know that the hardest part is keeping track of where everyone is up to and what everyone is working on. That's what Trello will help you see instantly at a glance. This is Trello. Trello is really simple. It's just a bunch of lists, and each list has on it multiple cards. And each card is one of the uh, little projects that your team is working on. On the right-hand side, you see a bunch of images here. Those are all the people on this team, and they all have access to this board. And uh, this particular team is a company called Artist Exploitation Incorporated. What they do is find uh, young garage bands on YouTube, and then give them an extreme makeover, and uh, then an exploitative recording contract. So on the left-hand side, we have the new bands that we've just found on YouTube, and we've, when we find a new one, all I have to do is click Add Card and type in the name of whoever we found on there. Um, each of these cards has a bunch of stuff on the back of it, which you get to just by clicking on the card. Uh, this one has uh, some voting, as you can see. There's a bunch of conversation, like a little chat here, and of course you can upload an embed thing, so there's an uploaded YouTube video of the uh, band uh, live if work. Uh, the first thing uh, that we're going to do on this team is uh, pick the top uh, ranked bands. Everybody votes on the ones that they like, and the ones that are best, uh, we're going to actually do live in-person auditions. And so we're just going to drag over some of those cards into the audition column in order to choose the ones that need an audition. And then I'm going to assign people to them. So I'm going to assign uh, Lena will be in charge of my little brother, and Tyler is Canadian, so you can do Girlfriend in Canada, and Justin's going to do Sudeik the Lemmer. And I really like that today, that Lemmer band, and it got a lot of votes. So I'm going to drag it up to the top here, uh, so we work on that one first. By the way, this stuff is all happening in a web browser over the internet, and everything is instantly synchronized as you make changes. So whatever changes I make here will immediately show up in all other browsers, uh, everywhere else on the internet. And so people can just keep a copy of this uh, open on their desktop and immediately see what's going on with their team as the changes are made. Um, they'll immediately reflect on there. All right, so Justin goes in, he does an audition of the Sedate the Lemmer band. He thinks they're really awesome. We're going to sign them up, and we send them over to the makeover department. <coughs> just by dragging them over here. And I'm going to assign our makeover artist, Michael, to work on that. Um, Michael is going to actually just draw a little uh, image of what he thinks the band should look like. Uh, there's his drawing, and upload this uh, to the back of the card where everybody can see it. There we go. And uh, finally, he's going to send it over to the final review process when he's done. And I'm in charge of all the uh, final reviews, so I'm going to assign myself to that card. And uh, when I look at this band, there's a couple of changes that I want to make. So I'm going to add a checklist here of all the things that I want to change. First of all, I think it should be a little bit more glam. Uh, secondly, I want to somehow find a way to exploit the teenage girl's love for vampires and Twilight and everything to do with that whole thing. And uh, third, more cowbell, definitely. Once I've added my checklist, I'm just going to take this card and send it back to the makeover department uh, where Michael's going to go in there and make these changes that I've asked for. He's already got a picture uh, that has a slightly more glam version. And then you can take that off. Uh, for capitalizing on Twilight, he's just going to propose a different name for the band. That should do that. And the cowbell we can always add in post-production. No problem. So he sends it to me for final review, and I love it. And I just drag it over to the record first album column, where we assign our recording engineer, John, to work on that. Now, everything about this process is completely uh, reconfigurable at will. So for example, OK. Anyway, so that's Trello. Does that look pretty uh, good, powerful tool there? It's absolutely free. And the funny thing is, this tool is not this uh, this business's primary thing. They actually do a lot. They do high-end web development and uh, and um, coding and, and all that other technical mumbo jumbo stuff. And they make a whole ton of money doing that. So, but they realized that they needed a tool that to help them with their own project management. I have paid for some really expensive project management tools. 
uh, in uh, my company. And when I saw this, I'm like, it doesn't do everything that project management tool does, but it boils everything down to what is most important, which is keeping track of people, moving things around, making it simple. Every single card has a, has a, like a mini discussion board, so, you, so it's always on topic and everything like that. So can, can you actually see really great uses of, of that in your classroom? Yeah, it's absolutely free. So it's a byproduct of what they naturally do. And, and they decided, hey, we're just going to give it out there and let people use it for free. Uh, because we're cool people, and they, they don't charge for it. I mean, they have premium versions where you can do extra features, but, you know. Yes, I saw a hand go up. So, I, I've had some experience with some software that, that I know. But again, three, they do an intro public offer, and they sell it. You don't want to buy it. They have all the information you post. Oh, you mean, uh, uh, you mean like, uh, FERPA-type uh, problems? Well, the thing is, like, you know, the only thing that they require is just an email address. So, you don't put any... Uh, any type of data in there that would like you know don't put grade book information in there. This is all basically you know project focused. So you have to be able to police that and make sure that you're not violating any uh, laws or regulations. So so I do do understand that concern and, uh, and that happens. But the thing is, th this is a tool. Like you know, this is a tool in your your <coughs> chest, and uh, you use it like you would like a hammer, uh, a saw, a knife, uh, you know, a blender or whatever. And, uh, and you use it accordingly. So it's not everything that you need for that. So that looks easy. So uh, my recommendation is go to that site, sign up uh, for it. Um, you don't even have to use it uh, for the classroom itself. You know, use it for your own personal like uh, checklist or to-do list, or even better than yet, use it for your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> you can say, hey, uh, why haven't you mowed the lawn yet? It's still in the to-do category. You need to get it over to the, the done. Oh, it's in progress. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, you said it was an app for Trello, so do you have to use it on a regular Trello? Oh, no, no, no. They have apps on, on devices, but it's a web app, so you can do it. You can go, so they work together. It works all. The web. Yes, absolutely. So they have an app, they have a web app, and they have the website, so you just go to it. Yes. Um, so you said that you could use it as a tool for project based learning, but you said you have to use it as a tool for the Oh, you use Trello? I have not. Oh, yeah. Using it. Oh, wonderful, it's wonderful. It's very nicely with that type of project where kids need to manage everybody's responsibility. Yes. And they're using technology. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. It's exciting. It's so much easier than wiki sites or I mean, all the other things that are out there. Absolutely. It's just drag and drop and it works. So, actually, I forgot to ask earlier if anybody here heard of Trello before this uh, one? Okay, oh, a few. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not a very popular because it's not considered an education tool. It's a corporate uh, project management tool. It's used by businesses, but hey, it works well for that purpose. <coughs> All right, so talk about learning <coughs> management systems. There's a lot of them out there. Uh, learning management systems are used to create uh, um, an a, uh, education environment so that the students can have calendars and message boards. Uh, there's actually a lot of really good ones. Like you know, the most popular one is Blackboard, so um, that uh, a lot of like post-secondary institutions use some secondary, but mostly secondary. Uh, you're using Moodle, um, and Moodle is actually a very good one. It's like the Facebook of uh, of education. So you know, there's a, you create a profile, you have a wall, you can and there's some education tools that are tied into that. So uh, you know, just raise your hands, like you know, uh, Blackboard users. Next generation is Canvas. I was going to mention that. Okay. Moodle, and Moodle. Okay, good, good. Canvas, all right. Canvas is amazing. I would consider Canvas almost like a, a Blackboard killer. So Canvas is based on brand new technology that's uh, uh, using modern uh, architecture. You know, from a from a color standpoint, I, I I like what they do. I mean, there's uh, a lot of great things about it. Where Blackboard is, I guess, old. <laughs> They're trying to keep up. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, Canvas is great. Anybody else have any other uh, learning management systems that they use? We use It's Learning. It's Learning, okay. There's a lot of them out there, but a lot of them have been gobbled up by, uh, by Blackboard. Blackboard. Yes. Uses Angel. Angel, which was recently gobbled up. It's not huh? It'll be Blackboard next year. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Angel, Sakai, and all those other ones, uh, yeah. So there's a lot of great ones. But the thing is, learning management tools other than Edmodo, which can be self-managed, uh, will require an IT infrastructure. So, so, so you have to get IT involved to be able to create a Moodle site effectively. It's, it's really hard to do that on your own. 
you know, Blackboard, obviously, you have to pay for that. Canvas, they do have uh, free and pay for options, and they do a really great job of support on that kind of stuff. So, so there's a lot of choices out there, but the importance is that this is how you manage your students, create message boards, and, and, uh, and create that online environment. Now, this next one, uh, content management. Now, this is near and dear to my heart. Uh, remember how I said earlier that um, I, I'm in this field for a selfish reason. reason. That's because I was not engaged with the content. I was not engaged in the class. I love video games. I wanted to create something that is unique. So, you know, content management comes in variety. You have file storage such as uh, Google Drive, Dropbox, uh, SlideShare. You know, these are ways to be able to put content online and organize it in, in, uh, in kind of like a virtual folder. But I and my team created KP Compass. Now, KP Compass. Now this isn't a plug for anything because this is absolutely free, but what I'm going to show you is basically an exclusive offer. This is a program that I'm offering for free that's in private beta, meaning that no one else can sign up for it. If not, if you go to the site, you can't get to it. But I'm going to show you, oh, I forgot to plug in, uh, how this technology creates an environment that works for me. And if I can find my power, there we go. So, because one of the biggest challenges is like, you know, if you do a, a information dump, there's no curation, there's no organization. And I'm going to show you how, with technology, oops, this up. with technology, we created what we call a personal digital tutor. So imagine this, every single student has a tutor. You know, wouldn't that be nice, right? Where every student would have a tutor that would engage with them, would learn them, would be able to give them the right kind of feedback at the right time. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be awesome? Now obviously, if we ever give every student a tutor, that'd be pretty expensive. Plus we don't have the manpower for that. Now, unless if you homeschool, then you have that personal relationship where you're trying to uh, get that to, uh, to the student. So with technology, we've augmented that process into what we call KP Compass. So what I'm going to show you here is my vision of the future of education. And I'm going to show you that by Trello, this is a byproduct of what we naturally do. And I make money doing other things. You know, one of the things that I do is I sell culinary arts and food science uh, curriculum that's already pre-crafted and done. And that's how I make money. So the platform is content agnostic. I Meaning I have teachers teaching in grade school, middle school, high school, college, and even adult education. Like I have a project with the state of Washington that's doing disaster preparedness with this system uh, uh, for professional development. So, what was that? What was that? Cobb County. Oh, yeah, yeah, and Cobb County uses us. You know, so, so uh, Cobb County, DeKalb uh, as well. But, um, but what we're doing is this. I'm going to just gotta go over a few concepts with you of like, you know, how this works, this is what we call a concept mastery system. So first thing is we have a module. A module is basically the, the, the main header of whatever information you're trying to get the students to learn. Then we have what we call concepts. So we break the information down into concepts because we're trying to get the students to understand and learn each individual concept here. So what, ha what happens is the student goes in and they engage the content. You know, this is concept one, concept two, you know, whatever. The content could be whatever, it could be a video, it could be uh, uh, text, maybe a boring PDF, boring PDF, and, uh, and all that. So, but the content is the content. Now, after the student's gone through the content, what's one of the first things you ask yourself after you've gone through a study, study session? Did I learn something, right? So what do you do? You go to the end of the chapter, you ask her those 10, 15 silly questions, you realize you missed half of it, you look up the answer. Is that learning? No. What? No, I didn't hear it. <laughs> no, right? That's just like learning, regurgitate, learning, regurgitate. For their entire lives, they've been taught this methodology of learning. Look up the answer, study it, and then pass the test. Teaching to the test. That's the worst thing we can do for every student. So this is a mastery system. What we want them to do is we want them to master each individual concept. So what happens is they go through the content, and they go to the digital tutor, and they say to the tutor, Hey, I just studied this information. Tell me if I know this information or not. And the tutor will say to the student, okay, you know, I'm, I'm just playing a role playing here. Okay, student, now, 
I'm going to ask you questions about every single topic here. I'm going to ask them in random order, and I'm going to try to figure out if you know this information or not. So I'm going to give you a knowledge check. So if you notice, it doesn't say test, it doesn't say quiz, it doesn't say assessment. All those negative connotations we're trying to remove. Because what we're doing is we're just say, saying to student, hey, you're going through a level. You're getting to a checkpoint. So you need to figure out where you're at. So we give them the knowledge check. And what happens is they get to ask a bunch of questions. And then here's where the magic happens. Afterwards, then they get this type of feedback. Now, don't pay attention to these letters. Uh, I won't have time to get into them, but there's an artificial intelligence built in. Uh, but in any case, uh, just think of this. Uh, colors. Red, bad, right? Green, good. <laughs> Orange, average. So the student got immediate feedback. The tutor just said, hey, based on my analysis of you, I feel like these two topics, you need to go back and really study. You need to focus on those areas. Because I, you didn't demonstrate to me that you know this information. Now these, you did well on. You've demonstrated mastery. You've shown to me that you know this content. So really good. And these are average. So you did OK. You have room for improvement. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reward you with this. I'm going to automatically remove content that you've already shown knowledge in. I'm not going to bore you with the information you've already done and shown good, uh, uh, really well with in. So you don't have to go through that level again. So then you're left with focus. So as a student, I look at this and go, OK, I've got eight topics I have to study. Seven, uh, the tutor just told me I really suck at seven and three. So I'm going to go and really spend a lot of time on that. And then I'm going to come over here. And I'm going to maybe like, you know, glance over and read the information for the other topics, just to kind of get a little refresher. Because when I'm done, I'm going to go back to the tutor for another, another knowledge check. And the tutor will say, OK, I'm going to ask you questions, but not the same questions. We're not going to repeat over and over and over and over again until they get it right. We're actually going to adapt the questions to the student. Uh, and, we, uh, and if anyone wants to look it up, we, the adaptive technology we use is called item response theory, or IRT. And we also use another based fundamental philosophy called abundant assessments, which I have, if I have time to show, I will. So, so now the student goes through and they get asked more questions. And the tutor will say, congratulations, you did well on these two. I'm going to turn them green and then remove them from your remediation set. Uh, this one you did good, this one you did better, so I'm going to turn it from orange to, to uh, I mean red to orange, and put a green arrow pointing up. Arrow up, arrow up, no change here, arrow down, red arrow down. That just shows me that you know less information than you did before. <laughs> what the heck happened there? So I'm going to turn this red. What you're seeing is immediate feedback loop. They're getting constant feedback. So after that knowledge check, they go, okay, well, I really screwed up on that one, uh, so I really got to focus on that again. Um, and the beauty of this is we're changing behavior. The students who are going through the system, it's behavioral modification of their study habits. Because never before have they had this in-depth, de detailed feedback on how they're studying. So if I was a student that came in here, and I go, okay, five minutes reading through that, check my knowledge, red arrows all down. Okay, well, I, I just took Mario and I jumped in that pit. So what am I going to do? Maybe I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to study a little harder and then uh, get it up. So what we're doing is we're rewarding students in two ways. Um, one is if you study hard, you get the content removed. That means you work less. You, work, you don't have to work as hard. That's a reward. Second, we're letting them learn through a remediation process, and we're giving them constant feedback. And then they're learning through their uh, way of focus. So eventually, they're going to get down to two, one, zero. Remember, everything I'm showing you is a formative process. This is a four. Formative assessments that's designed to get them ready for the summit exam, certification, whatever they need to do to pass that proctored examination and test. So it's all test preparation, or what we call constant mastery. So if I was a student and I walk into class on Friday, test this up, I'm going to go, OK, well, I know I, I didn't do very well on these two topics. Do I make the decision to study it, or do I not? I am the master of my own destiny now. I am walking into class and I know what I'm going to get. I'm actually confident because I have mostly greens. So I'm going to do well. Now, if it was mostly reds, then I'm going to walk into class and go, well, I guess I get what I deserve, right? It takes the mystery out. It gives them control. It gives them the understanding that if they don't make this decision and become responsible for their own learning, which they do, they have their own consequences. The mystery's gone. They're not waiting for that test. They're not going cram, 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 I hope, I hope, I hope. They're going, okay, cram, cram, okay, study, oh, feedback, 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 improvement, 
level up, and then we got that. So, um, yes, I see a hand up. Is this aligned to the serve safe exam? Oh, this, yes. Oh, yeah, That's it's, it's, this, the, the food safety section is, the, is utilized for a serve safe uh, certification examination. That's, the, that's what I've been focusing on, like Chinese restaurant, that's how I got into the food. Uh -huh. um, so what does everyone think about that model of learning? Wonderful, great. Grumble, grumble, grumble. <laughs> but the beauty of this, like Trello, it's easy. All we need is content. I mean, all you do is you take content. It could exist in any form. It could be, uh, you know, a website like, uh, like this one here. Like, you know, this is basically a pulling from a website on blueberry muffins, and it, uh, here's a, uh, uh, a YouTube video that was thrown in there. So whatever the content is, you put it in there. But the next key factor is questions. In order for abundant assessments to work, you have to have a lot of good questions for, uh, for that to uh, function. So. I want to address like, you know, one of the problems with like, uh, currently like when you're studying textbooks is that you're going through and you're highlighting, right? You're wasting your time highlighting because what you're trying to do is trying to find that key piece of information that's going to be on the test. So what exactly is happening is you're trying to second guess the system. You're trying to gain the system. You're trying to figure out what's the most important that's going to be on the test. So I'm wasting my effort trying to figure out what's important. So when we talk about mastery system, every piece of information is important. Don't bother highlighting. Learn everything. Because you might get asked this, you might get asked that, you might get asked that. And the questions aren't actually selected randomly. Using item response theory, we have a, an artificial intelligence that actually starts to understand what's more important and what's less important based on experience. So for example, if one of the questions you have in there is answered 80% of the time correctly, this, the tutor will automatically know that it's an easy question. So I'm not going to ask that question on the first round of assessments. Instead, I'm going to ask a harder question, which more students miss. Because if, if they beat the odds, we, uh, we have like, you know, a whole uh, calculus curve that actually measures all that, uh, then we can say, yes, you've proven yourself, you've answered the three questions that are designated hard based on my experience. And, uh, and then we can give you that green dot and deserve it. So uh, content is what it is. And what, um, uh, we had, I had a, uh, uh, a sign-up sheet going around, so I'm going to basically email you with that offer. Um, if you haven't signed up on this sheet, uh, you can, if you want to take your name off it, you can. <laughs> but, but I'm just going to send you a quick uh, email. But they, uh, they, they also do uh, make sure to fill out the evaluations, uh, by the way. So, well, the last thing I'm going to show you is like, you know, uh, results. So this is actually uh, showing you like, you know, you can see where everyone's at, uh, how everyone's performing. And you can basically like, you know, use this as a way to monitor your class, especially differentiating instruction when you have students going through modules at their own pace. It's a really great way to, to do that. So that's my selfish uh, part of the presentation, is that I wanted to create a system that works well for me, so that I'm getting the right kind of feedback. I'm doing it at my own time. I can actually do this on my smartphone if I wanted to. I can do it on my tablet. I could, I could uh, learn at my own pace. I can spend less time on the ones I, that I'm doing well on and more time on the ones that don't. And if I need help, the teacher can actually look and say, hey, uh, maybe I should come and help the student because like, they're showing up red here. So, what do you think about that? Good. Good. All right. Wonderful. Uh, no, that's great. Uh, question. Yes. Do you is the idea then that you would ask the students to complete the iterations until everything is green by a certain time? You can set the time frame uh, based on whatever you require. Sure. So it's an open system, so a student can do it faster or slower. But the thing is, you you, you need, if you need to pace your environment, you do that. So. So kind of like homework. Mm -hmm. But this is the well, theory part that yeah. they do offline. You set the time based on the summative exam. Okay. So the summative exam is like, you know, hey, we're going to test you on Friday. So if you're not ready by then, then you know, then too late now. So okay. yes. What are the numbers in parentheses? Oh, the numbers in parentheses represents how many times they've engaged the tutor with that self-assessment. So like this one here, 24 times. But well, this is an IEP student, so they require they require multiple repetitions. So that's not a bad thing, but it's an indicator of like how many times they engage. So some students, one, two times, they're done. Hey, more power to them. Oh, there's multiple methods. Uh, so I have like documentation on that. So what they offer is it's a, free, it's, a, it's a free content agnostic platform that allows you to put any content. So I got business teachers, I got finance teachers, I got fashion design teachers, I got um, uh, grade school teachers teaching music with it because they have content online already. And if it's not online, then you have uh, ways to upload it through Dropbox, Google Drive, 
and, and multiple services or, or YouTube or TeacherTube. So what it is, is it's curating all the cloud content, whether it be yours or other people's, and putting it into a, a organized format so that when your students are going through the content, they're not just clicking on links, they're just clicking on, like, what's next? Okay, next is this uh, page on blueberry muffins, next is this page on this video, so I have to watch it. Um, and then uh, you write questions about it. Um, and all, of, all the questions are actually uh, uh, tagged with Bloom's taxonomy, so, so you see this is like the question bank that I have, well, actually that's custom stuff that I added. So here's like, you know, some questions here. Um, and then basically the, the, uh, the digital tutor will pick questions based on uh, his understanding of it, or her understanding, it's maybe a, it may be a Siri uh, female uh, tutor, but, um, but, they, but, uh, but you put those two components in and then the system automatically does the rest. So uh, that's what I have here. Thank you so much for coming to my flip class session. I hope you learned a lot and I hope you enjoyed my session. Reach kids like me and get them engaged. So thank you very much. Oh yeah, and there's business cards up here if you want to, uh, if I forget to email you. Oh, okay. thank you. Thank you. Oh, can you start Yes. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Yeah.